All right, hello. Welcome to episode 496, Talk About Blow Podcast, part of the Blue Wire Network. Today is Wednesday, October 26, 2022. I'm joined for my weekly chat by my good buddy, writer, podcaster, and for this week, Buffalo Bills fan. Every single week you're on this show, Mm -hmm. it's always... We let the audience know it is Buffalo Bills watcher, Joe Yurden. This week, yes. playing the Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers. This is mm-hmm. a Buffalo Bills fanboy episode, I guess, because I yeah. never wear, if you're watching this on YouTube, guys, I never wear Bills gear on the show. I got a Bills hat on today. Joe Yurden's joining me. He's got in the background a red Buffalo Bills mini helmet. He is all in mm-hmm. for the Buffalo Bills. Oh, yeah. What's going on, buddy? How you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. It's uh, it's funny. It's funny kind of just being like, yeah, I'm all Bills this week. Go Bills. Because uh, I never, like, people are always like, yeah, go Bills. And I'm like, yeah, okay. But this week I'm like, yeah, that's right. Go Bills. Big fan. Let's do this. That let's, is. Let's end Aaron Rodgers' career this week. Let's get it over with. <laughs> that is awesome. And we're Aaron certainly going to. Get him out of here. I want him going. We're definitely going to spend some time talking about uh, Bills Packers coming up this Sunday. And I'll get your perspective on someone that, and obviously Buffalo Sabres off to a great start. Got to tell you, though, so Joe's usually joining me now on Tuesdays. We're a day late, and it's 100%. Well, I don't want to say my fault because there's not much I could do about it. But, right. dude, I have been uh, – you know this. We talk all the time. But mm-hmm. for people listening or people watching, you know, wondering why there was no show yesterday or whatever, if you follow me on social media, I've been a little more scarce with that late. Dude, I've been sick as shit, man, for – God, man, going on probably close to – to two weeks right now you know back in 2012 i caught i had a cough that was so deep and so bad i'll never forget it i ended up my wife took me to mercy and i just i couldn't stop coughing and i was like wheezing coughing but didn't stop me from smoking cigarettes that's one thing i will remember like literally parking my wife parked we walked into the from the parking ramp in there and i was literally smoking a cigarette couldn't even breathe, wheezing, coughing. Anyway, my point was this. I was really, really sick. I ended up getting admitted, and they quarantined me because they were testing me for whooping cough. That's how bad it was. So when you have whooping cough, like they literally will quarantine your ass. Mm-hmm. So I was in the hospital for three days, and I was diagnosed with COPD. And this was back in 2012. I was Again, I was still smoking. Quit smoking. That, that cigarette I had going into the hospital was the last one I ever had. But anyway, my point was, I couldn't even breathe, man. I was coughing so bad, so deep. And I was just really sick. And I say that because that's the only time I can remember, at least in my adult life, that I can remember that I think I was sicker than I've been over these last couple of weeks. You know, and we've talked about this on the podcast. How my, my buddy, yeah, we had that big benefit for him um, earlier this month. We talked about, you know, all the great sponsors and the people who showed up and all the money that was raised. Lost in that is... We still live in a world where COVID and illness is a big problem. And uh, as it turns out, that was, uh, I don't know any other way to say it. It was a COVID super spreader event. That's what it basically turned out to be. I know personally of 14 people from that benefit who tested positive for COVID later that week, including the person whose benefit it was for, who's here, who came up um, from Florida staying with his sister, his sister and her husband were two of the 14. They got it. Oof. So Ryan came up for the bed, ended up staying at a buddy's house. But he had no choice. But anyway, so 14 people got diagnosed with COVID and many other people got sick. It's also that time of year, flu season, just whatever. Right. I don't know what it was that I caught, but last two weeks ago, I started feeling, or last Thursday, I started feeling shitty, got a little bit better. But this weekend, Joe was the worst man. Uh, I ended up going to urgent care on Saturday, and I hate. We talked about this off here. I really hate going to the hospitals for yeah. lots of reasons, but um, I just these. I've had headaches and dizziness, and uh, just a sore back, fatigue, and I just have not been able to shake it. I feel pretty good right now, but again, I was supposed to feel pretty good yesterday when we were going to tape mm-hmm. our show, and I couldn't do it, man. But it's just uh, it's scary shit. I was my daughter took me to urgent care. Cause my wife's in Florida right now working and went to Wegmans to get some scripts. And I'm telling you, I was so worn out and drained. I could barely walk back to her car and she dropped me off at home 
And I was literally shivering, taking my temperature. My temperature was up to like 102.6. And this is after going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I slept for five hours. I never, it was like I jumped into a swimming pool, man. I sweating, Mm t-shirt, pillowcase, blanket, sheets, everything just drenched. And I don't know, man, I feel good for spurts, but I'm not out of the woods, I guess. I'm not over it completely yet, man. When's, do you remember like the sickest that you've been? Because again, this is just. Mm. I'm having a hard time getting over this, man. Like when, when, what's the sickest you can remember being? Cause this shit is freaking tough, man. And it just doesn't seem to want to go away. It was, uh, I think it was 2015. It was April, 2015 or 2014. It was, tw- I think it might've been 2014. Um, it was like end of the season, like end of the season. And I was feeling like, kind of crap you know it was we're getting we're getting down to like the last week or so of the year i started feeling kind of crappy and i was like all right whatever and that was when that was when the maple leafs hired brendan shanahan because i drove up to toronto to uh to cover it for nhl.com so up there for the press conference the whole thing no easy ride to toronto and i was like yeah i feel kind of kind of eh like it's just like it's one of those things like it's like i'm gonna get sick but like i feel okay right now uh so i go up there go to take care of the press conference, do the whole thing. And the ride home was like Toronto traffic. It was like a three and a half, almost four hour drive back. And it kicked into high gear somewhere, somewhere right in the middle uh, between Mississauga and Toronto, which is they're not far apart from each other, but like somewhere stuck in traffic there, it started to hit me like a, like a freight train. And I was I was like, okay, all right, well, let's just get home. Let's let's relax. And I'd forgotten I was handling the site that night for NBC. So I was late getting back because of traffic. So I, like, I get home and I'm like, all right, well, I got to stay up until after all the games are done tonight because I got to do I got to do stuff for that site. And I was like, okay, well, maybe I can rest tomorrow. And I'm, then like I was I was toast for like the next week and a half. Like, I mean, we're talking fever, no energy, just white. Yeah completely wiped and it was misery and you know it's it's you know like april april in buffalo was like one of those abnormally warm april days and i was just like no it needs to be cold outside because i'm sweat sweat like a pig sucks i hate it and yeah i was it was like a week like a week almost like almost two weeks long of just feeling like absolute garbage it sucked it was awful it the 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 worst part is and I don't know, maybe specifically with whatever has been ailing me is I would feel fine. Like for an example, last Friday, I work a second job at a restaurant and I, it was 8 PM. I know this because a, a very good friend, of my cousin was acting, having a, a birthday party at Rusty Buffalo Friday night. And my plan was to go to work, fly home, change up real quick, freshen up and, and go there and have a, a couple of drinks for his birthday. Eight o'clock. I felt pretty good. My shift ended at 10 at about 10 o'clock. Um, at the bar, at, at the restaurant where I work, I was having a conversation with, with two people there and I could, I felt it coming on. I was telling you this before we started taping, mm-hmm. like my telltale sign throughout all these two weeks is it would come and go, but I'd start getting pain in the middle, like this cold, achy feeling in the middle of my back. And then it would, and it would, I would feel good. And then this would come out of nowhere. And like 10 minutes later, my head would, I, my head would start hurting and feeling this pressure mm-hmm. and getting dizzy. By the time it got to be 10 o'clock middle of the conversation, I'm like, Holy shit! I'm not. I don't think I'm going anywhere. I yeah. could barely even drive home by that point. And like I said, it really started Man. Friday night, and it's just been uh, it's coming and going. It's it's, it's really it's frustrating, man. And then, like I said, I woke up Saturday. I felt even worse, and uh, it's just been frustrating. I and it always seems like you always get sick when you got the most plans, like the most things that are going on. It was a gorgeous weekend, mm-hmm. bunch of things going on to do, and I've. Man. I'm here talking to you though. I guess that, that's the uh I shouldn't complain. Come out on the other side of it and <laughs> knock on wood, you're gonna be fine from here on out as you start coughing and as I start coughing. To- <laughs> <laughs> <All it's doing. laughs> Not all bad though. By the way, I, I told you this too yesterday because I again I'm we're taping this Tuesday on Monday. I felt pretty good in the morning when you and I were talking. Mm-hmm. Took my son to a, a car dealership, pretty big milestone for a young for a teenager starting oh, to become yeah. a young man bought his first car on his own his own money his own down payment his own credit you know his own financing his own insurance all that stuff man uh 
not, you know, it's a, a used car, but a nice used car. Put it this way. Right. It's nicer than my current car. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Kids, you know, 19 going on 20 is pretty good. Uh, father, son, little milestone. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So at least I was coherent enough and feeling good enough to kind of be a, enjoy that yesterday but what, yeah that, uh, that, what did he what did he pick out what what's the what was a the nissan sentra okay nice. not a great car it's a it's a nice economy compact car he like he didn't he want a big car he didn't want an suv or any of that stuff which considering the way gas prices are and stuff yeah. that's uh that's great but yeah man really cool problem for me at least anyway i'm a nostalgic person i get sentimental really easy and i look back at you know more i try to live in moments and i just i don't know you look at your, your kids and they grow up and they end they're doing things and to me that's just one of those things that he'll probably remember 23 i don't know if you remember when you got your first car or not yeah i do i i do it was a piece of shit you know and it wasn't <laughs> through a dealership but i remember buying my first car but yeah man those are cool little milestones to be able to enjoy with your kids you know your family so yeah. not all bad yeah i i'm the weirdo that didn't get their license until well after i was 20 which me is too. really really insane considering like i mean Everybody, it seemed like everybody in my high school class got it instantly at 16. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm not, I, I, if I got it, I was like, I know I'm not getting a car. So like, what's the point? Like, <laughs> I'm going to drive my, you know, my parent, one of my parents' cars around. Like, no, they're not going to let me do that. So I was like, forget it. It's not, no point in getting it. But then it's like, I get to college and it's like, hey, why don't you drive it? I'm like, I can't. And they're like, what do you mean you can't? And I go, I don't have a license. They're like, what? I'm like, well, what do you mean? I was just like, never, never had a reason to get it. And they're like. You never wanted to drive? I go, well, yeah, sure. I sure I did, but like I wasn't gonna get a car. Like there was just no there was no way I was gonna get one. So criminal like, by criminal, the time I turned 23, I was like, I think I have to get one now. <laughs> criminal confession for me, man. I, I didn't get my license until I was in my early 20s as well. However, I was also I was driving before I wow. had my license. I was going to college at Duval College. I had a I got a car to this day. I mean, Jesus Christ, this was so long ago. And don't ask me why I didn't bother to get my license i have no earthly idea right i don't know i was, a, I was an idiot teenager but I, I don't know how but i was able to get a car i was able to get a car registered in my name without having a license i don't even know how that was possible back then but uh i did i drove i had a permit I, i'm pretty sure i had a permit i know i had a permit mm -hmm. but i actually didn't have my license i drove for a couple of years without having a license i would not advise that for anyone out there listening or watching right now but i do remember that say i hope uh i hope the statute of limitations is up on yeah <laughs> I'm driving without a license. I think you're good, but you never know. All right. Anyway, so I was a criminal as a teenager. I'm <laughs> sick. I'm on the men. I won't say I'm all the way there yet, but I, I, I certainly feel um, a lot better. And, uh, you know, people always yeah. say the worst. By the way, I did get, I, I self-tested for COVID five freaking times. And when I went to urgent care on Saturday, they gave me a real test. I had no COVID and also that I tested negative for antibodies. Well, I guess when you get COVID, you, you know, you get the yep. antibodies and it shows up. I think I might have tiger blood because I don't, how do I not get COVID? My wife has had it twice. My daughter has had it. Mm -hmm. I was, I've been at many events, including one just a couple of weeks ago that was basically a super spreader. Yep. Yet I don't get it. I don't know. Maybe I would have been better off getting it than compared <laughs> to, you know, how I felt the last two weeks. Um, right. But no say that sarcastic I'm not, I, I, <laughs> it's uh i don't know i was at a i was at a wedding this summer and it was a same situation like a bunch of people ended up coming down with it like somebody in the wedding party had it like the day before and then they're like all right they got to send that guy home and then suddenly a bunch of people came down with it afterwards the people i rode with to the to the wedding both came down with it but i didn't like every like half the people i was hanging out with most of the night all had it I didn't. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I don't understand how this works. Cause I figure if everybody around me has it, then I definitely do. And I definitely did not. So I, I, I uh, forget it. I don't even understand anything anymore. Someday down the road, I hope that there will be some explanations and clarifications on how some people just didn't get it when it seems like everyone in this world mm -hmm. should have gotten everybody. I'm sure there's everyone out there has been exposed directly, whether they know it or not, to people who have had it. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just, uh, it's weird. But anyway, like I said, I'm on the mend. The kid got a car. It, 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 pretty good week, all things considered, except right. for before we get to Bills and Sabres, we're both Yankee fans. So I, I, I got to touch um, on this. Um, yeah. The Yankees got swept. You know, it sucks, but I'll tell you this, Joe, I never, and I said this 
before they even played Cleveland, I think, and maybe even during the regular season. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, it sucks. I look, I hate losing in the playoffs and as a Yankees fan. Of course, I want to win the World Series, but mm -hmm. I never thought that they were gonna win. I never thought they were gonna beat Houston. I never thought this team was a World Series winning roster when mm -hmm. you looked at it. Like, you know, on Twitter, the the Yankees would put a graphic up of their lineup, and I'd be like, This lineup's really not that good. Yeah. And the pitching staff, they had pretty much two pitchers that they could rely on, and that was it. There was not many people in the bullpen that you could count on reliably. The mm -hmm. back end of the rotation wasn't very good. They were very home run dependent. Um, not enough guys got on base. They hit like shit with runners yeah. in scoring position. And they played a very good Houston team. So all the I, I just it kind of reminds me of the Bills back in 2017. Now the Yankees won 99 games and were a right. one of the favorites. So right. I want to what I in a way, it reminded me of the 2017 Bills. Like, and they were on a pace for like 120 wins at some point, like in like right, May. Right. Like May or exactly. June. Yes. It, was, it was like, wow, they, these guys never bought it. Though. The 98 team. And I'm like, I don't think so. I Right. I never bought it. But what, what I mean with the Buffalo Bills comparison back in 2017 is this. I didn't expect the Bills to get to the playoffs. When they got to the playoffs, I looked at this team. I said, they're not winning the Super Bowl. So mm -hmm. I felt like we were playing with house money. The Yankees, I never thought they were going to beat Houston. I, I truly didn't. I think yeah. Houston was a much better team, and we saw that for four games. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know what it is, by the way, about Houston, but the Yankees just – it seems like they play their worst baseball against us. It's, it's like they just – they freeze. I mean, they 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 freeze like a deer in headlights whenever they play uh, the Astros. But anyway, I just – I, this is all going to lead to a question here. I mean, we all, we don't need to analyze the series. The better team won, but here's what I do have a problem with. I get how Yankee fans are. I am a Yankee fan. I've been to many Yankee games in the Bronx. I'm sure you've been to Yankee games in the oh, Bronx. Yeah. We know how it works in New York. Yeah. We know the media. We know the market. We know the expectations. We know all that. Your boy, Aaron Judge, puts up 62 home runs, mm -hmm. gives the team a historic season, literally – the most home runs in the history of the American League, mm -hmm. and in some people's opinions, anyway, the, the the legitimate true home run record right now. And again, that's not really what we're going with this. Here's the thing, though: he struggled just like pretty much all the team did in the postseason, and especially yep. against Houston. And these motherfuckers booed his. They were booing his ass, man. Yeah. I mean, look, he's not in year two of a ten-year contract. This is a guy who's going to be a free agent. Mm -hmm. He's giving you the best regular season, maybe in the history of the entire franchise, and you're fucking booing him. And you know you're going to lose the series, and you're on your way out. You're booing him. Yeah. What What's your take on that, man? I, I get Yankees fans are passionate. We could be a little yeah. passionate too, but really, uh, that's that that stuff is dumb. I, and I don't know. I, I mean, I was half paying attention to the stuff. Cause I was like, they don't have it. Like I just, I just right. knew they didn't have it. Uh, you know, they had, you know, they were getting beat by Cleveland. It was hitting like bloop singles like all the time. It's like, really? Like, if, I don't know, knocking a few more runs. You're not going to lose to bloop singles. But, um, so it was like, I was just I was like, whatever they don't, they don't have the horses to deal with these guys. And, and so, you know, guys getting booed. I mean, Jesus, it happens to friggin' everybody. Like, I mean, I think the only guy it never happens to is Jeter. Maybe. Mattingly, he got booed Mattingly a little Jeter, bit, you know, like a little bit. Yeah, but still, I, man. Still, it's uh, it's, it's dumb. It's it's dumb. But I, it's, I don't know. It's the airing of grievances. Like those last two games at the stadium were were festivist because it was just all the problems that had popped up since July. Sure, with the team manifested themselves all the way to the end of the season and definitely in the playoffs. So I get it, and there were some obvious issues. They got bad injury luck with the guys that they added at the deadline. You know, the you know um, almost all those guys were were hurt or got hurt at some point and were you, you know effectively useless. So you're using with guys way down the lineup. There's you know all kinds of junk. You know, Garrett Cole gave up too many home runs this year. Fine, he was still great, but you know, bad time home run will kill you. Sure. Um, you know, you know, Cortez was pitching with a bad groin, I guess, for a couple a couple games. Like that sucks. And you know, they kept playing IKF shortstop. The guy can't hit. 
He also can't field. They played him because he could field, and he can't do that. It's like what a terrible trade that was before the season. Uh, when you look back, IKF and Josh Josh Donaldson. Josh Donaldson was horrific at the plate in the in the Carpenter. Carpenter player. Carpenter missed too much time, so he was his bad. He was rusty, and he it showed. Yeah, yeah. He didn't get any. He didn't get any rehab games, so his swings off. And like you're bringing him in against the team that is like one of the better pitching teams. Like, of course, he's not gonna he's not gonna be on the ball yet. I mean, the guy was great. They picked him up like it, suddenly they had a, a lefty bat that could just crush sure. home runs all the time. Awesome, yeah. and he's a vet, so it was, it was great. But I don't know, man. I it's I, I'm still I'm I was frustrated with how Aaron Boone ran the bullpen for all, like almost the entire season, and definitely in the playoffs. Did you hear what he did to try to get the team motivated? I had a game game four. Yeah, he showed him the 2004 3-0 Red Sox series. Isn't that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, Can you <laughs> get the fuck out of here? I, I, it, I, I, I still can't deal with that being the motivational tactic. Like that literally happened to the team you're managing, and not all that long ago. I mean, well, 2004 is 18 years ago now, so I mean, whatever. But, um. But I mean, like Jesus, dude. Like I know nobody on that on the team right now played on that team. But if there were, I would have been punching Aaron Boone in the face. Like, you kidding me? Like this is the way you're gonna this is the way you're gonna motivate us by like rubbing our nose and like what happened that year? Like I I understand the point. Like you know, hey, they came back from down three zero, whatever. I was like, yeah, but you know what helped cause the Yankees to lose that series? Really bad managing, especially yeah. the bullpen, Aaron. Figure it out, man. Like, Ugh. come on. It's just, I will. I, I, I can't believe that that ha- a that happened that they that they did that. B that they haven't fired it. They didn't fire him two, ten minutes after the after game four was over. And C that he's. I mean, as if we're taping this right now, he's still the manager of the team. I, I, I see I, reports say that he's expected back as is Cashman. I, I uh, seen reports well, out Cash, there today I, saying that. Well, I don't know. That that's a whole other conversation where how how Steinbrenner is the problem. Because he yeah. wants to save money off the luxury tax. Screw, screw that, man. The Do, do yeah. the Dodgers care? No. Do the Mets care? No. Like, suddenly, suddenly the Red Sox and Yankees give a shit about the tax. Give me a break. I, I, I think one point. Billion dollar teams get lost. I agree. with I, And I think one point that we're both making here is that neither of us, I, I think, thought the Yankees were maybe as good as they looked earlier no. in the year. No. And again, I didn't think they were a World Series team. I don't, I don't think you no. did either. But no. cir- circling back to Aaron Judge. All right. So look, man. Four for twenty-seven in uh in the series, so he batted mm-hmm. zero sixty-three in the series. That's awful, and he yep. was only five of twenty-six in the playoffs. Again, terrible. Mm-hmm. Point being, though, the, again, the guy had a historic season, and he's set to become a free agent. Mm-hmm. Um, the Yankees did not sign him before, so you know he's going to be a free agent. And when you, when you clock sixty-two home runs, you know you're going to go yeah. get paid. I mean, let's just put it that way. The problem with Aaron Judge. Off. Like they, they, they did make him an offer. They just, did. They, he was like, they he's did. like, oh, I'm betting on myself. I think right. I need more. Right. And, and I think that the uh, his injury history going into this season, can the guy stay healthy for 162 games? That might have been a big reason why oh, the Yankees sure. did not want to maybe go all in on what he should be worth. All right. So now you got a guy. Do you think if you're Aaron Judge, are you old? Or is this just part of the game? Is this just part of being a Yankee? Or are you going in the free agency right now? I'll be like, all right, man, these motherfuckers are booing me and shit. I'll show you. I could go get paid wherever I want. Do you think that that might affect him whatsoever? No, I don't think so. I think I think his focus is he deserves to be paid, you know, as one of the top guys in the league. Absolutely. They're, they're talking 500. I saw a report today that he might get 500 million over 10 years, 50 million. Yep guaranteed per season mm-hmm. oh, 50 yeah. million dollars a year well i ever i think almost everything in baseball is fully guaranteed, guaranteed. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. um uh, like for him the biggest thing for him and for the pa too is that the the per year payout is really high because i think they offered him what 240 240 or no uh 240 or 270 250 i, I forget but it was for 10 years so it's 25 million a year it's like well Hey, that's really cool. But like Max Scherzer is getting paid like what, uh, like 30 million a year for the Mets, you know, yeah. and he's 38, like, okay, well, he's a pitcher and he's there for two, you know, for a couple of years, he's getting, you know, he's getting paid like that. He's like, you know, no offense to Max Scherzer, but you know, Aaron Judge just had a historic season. So, you know, is he worth more than 25? Yes. Is he more worth more than 27? Yeah. Hell yes. Like I, I it's going to be, it has to be north of 40 million a year for him i think but it's it gets scary because he's what 30 
30 yeah, now, I'm I think. I'm 29, 30? Around yeah. that. I'm not quite sure. I, I'd have to look it up. I mean, but, you're, um, but you're looking at a situation where he's going to have, it's going to be the same thing as Stanton, where, you know, Stanton's got, you know, Marlins gave Stanton, what, 30, 31 million a season? Like, you know, G- Jeter gave him 31 million a season because he was, you know, he had like an, you know, MVP season with the freaking Marlins. And so they paid him a ton of money. And then like a year and a half later, they're like, oh crap, we don't have any money. We got to, we got to move this guy. And we're at, you know, there's a couple of years left on that contract. And like, I ain't looking so good right now. I mean, he hit 30 home runs this year, but he hits what, 220 now. Like, mm-hmm. okay. And he gets hurt a bunch. I don't know. Like, I mean, you love having that bat, but at the same point, like, that production is going to fall off at some point. You don't know when. So uh, I don't know. Uh, to me, I don't know. Like the Mets want, I, I'm sure the Mets would love to to steal them away from the Yankees. and Dodgers too. Dodgers would love to do it too. Don't forget the Giants. Cause he's yeah. from, he's from this, he's from the Bay area. The Giants would, Giants got the money. Giants got plenty of money. Like would he love to just go back home and play there? You know, I mean, no home. Guys going back home is a big deal. I don't know if it's such a big deal in baseball because it's a little weirder, but um, but if he went to San Francisco, I wouldn't, you know, I, I would totally understand. I mean, people, you know, laugh at the Yankees. Oh, you couldn't pay him. It's like, you can't pay a guy in home. Like, you know, you can't just be like, well, New York's his home now. It's like, no, Northern California is his home. Over. Sure. Aaron, so, by the way, he's uh, he's 30 years old and he'll be 30. 31 Early in a- or April when uh 2023 season starts, so he'll be turning 31. So he's not he's no spring chicken, man. Yeah. When so it's I all mean, said and done, do you think he's do you think he's back in New York when it's all said and done? I think it's realistic he could be gone. I I I, I think it's very realistic he could, he could be gone. I think they'll unless they got something else cooking, which there they've been there's been rumors that they want to get an Otani, which that I mean that started like a year ago. Yeah. Um, unless they get something cooking there. Um, and they're and they're pretty sure they're going to make that happen. I I could see that see them being like, okay, well, Judge is thirty. We don't like how the you know the final five years of that contract might sit because we got to give him a ten year deal because we got to pay him a ton of money, and we don't know if we really like how that's going to look at towards the end of it because you could be looking at Stanton going like, oh boy, that's we're looking into Aaron Judge's future with that right there. Now Judge is a freak physically, so it's a little different. So Stanton, but um. Stanton can't really field anymore. Judge can. <laughs> Judge is a very good fielder, but I don't know. It's not having it done is such a big deal because you're leaving it open for somebody else to swoop in. And that's, that's the problem, but I don't know. He's done so many things with the Yankees right now. It would look really bad if, if they get beat out by somebody pay, like paying him more and it's, within the within the realm of an easy well, quote unquote easy payout for the Yankees like if it's something cuz people got mad like when you remember Robbie Cano when Seattle signed him to that insane deal and mm-hmm. people were like well why did the Yankees offer him that it's like well they offered him like 170 million the Mariners came back with 240 and he's like yeah peace see ya like i mean they tried they tried they offered him a ton of money Mariners just went way over the top so uh, i mean if they offer the judge like 10 years, 400 and somebody comes back at him at 10 years, like 50, like, or 10 years, uh, 10 years, 500. Okay. I mean, like, what are you going to do? I mean, it's just kind of like, you have to just kind of eat, eat shit and say goodbye. I don't, I, it would be a huge PR nightmare for the Yankees to not bring back Aaron judge. I, I think at the end of the day, shitty mm-hmm. postseason aside, or, you know, maybe a little bit of, bad will with the booing or or whatever i just look a couple of years ago that right there was alleged interest in bryce harper and they didn't want to pay him now you look what bryce harper is doing in the playoffs right now he's literally harper. i know oh, i know damn it. literally carrying the phillies to the world series right now and you look back and you're like you got fucking josh donaldson and scrub and and, and some of these other guys man you can't lose I, if you're in the yankees Especially if you're bringing back a lot of people want Boone and Cashman gone, and I don't think either that that's not going to happen. And then on top of that, you let Aaron Judge go to the Dodgers or the Mets. I don't think the Mets are a realistic thing, but I do think that I know the Mets got money, but I could see him going out west to L to Giants or LA or staying with New York when it's all uh, said and done. Man, you had to mention the Harper thing because there's there's a quote that of course started circling uh, back again with him just going, you know, He-Man style for the Phillies. Uh, and it was basically, it was, I think it was that su- the summer he became a free agent or that, that winner, excuse me. Um, 
where he was like quoted as saying, he's like, yeah, I'd love to put on the pinstripes, become, you know, go become a hall of famer and, you know, have, you know, have the great, you know, win some world series be awesome. I'd love to do that. And then the Yankees look at him like, mm, I don't know if we want to pay him that much. I don't know. Like, and like that dude didn't sign until like spring training was like a week into it. Yeah. Like he was still a free agent because all these teams were just kind of like colluding. Oh, did I, sorry. Did I say colluding? <laughs> yeah. They were colluding to not try to not pay him. It was, same stuff with him and Machado and then Correa last year. The Yankees, I mean, listen, George Yankees sign all these guys and everybody hates the Yankees, will hate the Yankees for eternity because they put an all-star team together. But sign one of them. Don't play IKF at shortstop. Sign Correa. Like, I mean, I know you hate him because the Astros stuff, but like, I don't know, man, best shortstop out there. Go, go freaking sign him. Sign Bryce Harper. So you don't have Aaron Hicks out there, you know, not fielding well and not hitting like, Aaron Hicks has four more friggin' years on his contract. What the hell are they going to do with that? You know, he can't play anymore. He's done. It's crazy. All right. I am back with Joe Yurden, turning our attention to uh, Buffalo Sabres here. Let me read you a tweet from a brilliant person that I know. I just tweets from myself, actually. But oh, okay. It, was, it was, like, was a question that I posed to Twitter, and I'm posing this to you uh, specifically. This is what I said okay. word for word. So let, let's start here, and then we'll go over a couple things. But I said, how long do the Sabres have to play at the level that they are right now before we start considering them a team that can legitimately make the playoffs? Granted, I'm a knee-jerk reactor, but my expectation for that is that they're almost there already worst case they should be a fringe playoff contender i want to get your reaction and by the way for people listening right now or watching which by the way if you're watching this on youtube make sure you hit that subscribe button and the like button as well but anyway my my question for you and and again premise this by saying we're taping this tuesday before they play at seattle so if they go out and lose five nothing tonight my expectations have not changed <laughs> but anyway what, what's your take on that like right now if you're a sabers fan and you're thinking down the road playoffs a little bit. I know they've had some hot starts in the past, but I feel like this team's a little bit different. So like, what do you think fans expectations should be right now? Cause I'm like, why can't this team be a playoff contender right now? <laughs> well, let's take a dip back into Sabres recent Sabres history. Okay, shall we? I guess. Uh, so let's, uh, I'm trying to remember the year. I think it was, I think it was 15, 16. Let me go back and look 15, 16. Of course is the, the last quote unquote good year that they've had in a while because they had 81 points. That was the good year. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking back because I'm trying to think. It was either that year, 16, 17, or 17, 18. It might have been 17, 18. Um, but there was a year where... Um, they had that like 10-game undefeated streak, right? Well, no. There, well, well, streak. This is a different year. <laughs> oh. There was, a, there, there was a season where they uh, they were coming out of their bye week. Well, it might have been 17, 18. They were coming out of their bye week was it then? No, I think, eh, I don't know. But they were coming out of their bye week. They were playing uh, Arizona and Colorado on the road after that. I remember that. And you know what I'm talking about. They were, here it is. Yeah, it was, uh, what season it was? 16, 17. They had to play Arizona, Colorado on the road in, you know, late February. And it was like, they were in striking distance of a playoff. Like, mm -hmm. we're talking like, a, like single digit points of being like, well, if they win these two, they're not just in the hunt. They're in the race now. Like they're sure. like they're involved. What did they do in those games? That, that season, Colorado, that season was horrific. Like that was the, uh, that was the dive for McKinnon season. They, they went, what, what was it? They had 48 points. Dude, four, Sabres were never bad enough to get 48 points. Like that, that's, that's a bad season. It's a really sure. bad season. So what do they do? They lose five, three to them. Okay. Well, then they play the coyotes the next game. Coyotes were 70 point team, so they're so they were still not good. They lose to them, and then after that was it was it was done. They were I, I remember that after that because like I'm I'm looking at the end of it from that point after that bye week. Let me count up how many games they won. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven games out of uh, seven out of 19 games they won from that from the end of that from that point from the uh, after the bye week ended to the end and they were done. And that's the end of February. I remember that. Yeah. Like, they, like they were in a legit place where they could make a run at a playoff spot and it all came apart. 
and it, this is, it, everything blew up in their face and it was bad and it was like oh boy okay what are they you know how is this gonna go and i think was that that was bilesman's last year so everything got really murky afterwards because that was the um that was the game in columbus uh they had the columbus game in march this is where when opozo got his concussion during practice that year that was the that was the summer where he had like the really scary incidents all that stuff happened and he got a concussion in practice the day before they go to columbus and they were like oh crap uh kyle can't play and we got a game tonight and we don't have enough there's not enough time to get somebody from rochester to here so they had to dri- they were going to punish sam reinhardt that night he was going to be a healthy scratch he was supposed to be because he you know whatever the hell happened who knows instead they had to play reinhardt because they didn't have an extra forward so reinhardt suits up is on play like is on the roster plays like he's on the ice in the game in uniform the whole thing and played zero minutes Zero oh, minutes, zero yeah, seconds. Yeah, yeah. He just sat on the bench the entire game as punishment, which is an insane thing to do to anybody. But they were forced, forced to do that. Like that, that this is just one of the many thousands of things that have happened just since like 2013 with this insane team. So to it's the long road to answering your question. They have to get through February to be taken seriously because we've seen, we've been here. We've been down this road, like the 10 game winning streak. The the one time it was what, that was November. And everyone's like, Oh, here we go. And then by January it was done. And yeah. were, like it, even before it was like a week into January, it was over with. And then uh, what was it? Um, uh, I want to say it was, was it, was it Ralph's first year? Where they started off really hot in October. Uh, yeah, they've had some hot starts. I was looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Um, yeah, no, it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was Ralph Kruger's first year, and Carter Hutton was on, like unbeatable. He was, he had an mm-hmm. unbelievable first month. He got banged up, and then they immediately, <laughs> they immediately lost six straight games, and then it was like, well, we'll see you later. That'll do it. And they were to- they finished that. <laughs> they finished that season uh, losing seven of the last 10 games, including six in a row. Yeah. But, I mean, like this, these are the things that can happen. Like, I, I'm not going to take anybody's joy away with, with how they're playing. They're playing fun. They're playing exciting. They're, they're a ton of fun to watch. Like they're like, their games are high paced. Like, I've watched every everybody. second they're, of their games this year. It's super fun. But if you start saying like, all right, we got to start talking playoffs now, pump those friggin' brakes, park the car <laughs> over, take the keys out of the addiction, throw the keys out the window for, for a few months. But you know, I'm a knee jerk reactor. Oh, I mean, yeah, you already, no, you already know great. this, man. I'm just saying, pull over and enjoy what they're doing right now because the expectations of making the playoffs this year. And I said this, I said this during the friggin' summer, expecting playoffs this year is asking way too much because I mean, yeah. they were 76 point team last year. Like, it's a lot. You have to you have to get a hundred points to basically make the playoffs. That's a huge difference. I'll tell you this much. Right now, I mean, to your point, this team is fun. All right, the difference with me between the Bills and the Sabers is this: no matter how bad the Bills suck, no matter how bad they suck, the drought years. I'm I'm old, so in the mid '80s, they were fucking unwatchable. Yeah. But I still watched them. And when when the games weren't blacked out, you know what I mean, on, on TV or whatever. It was the, I, uh, still, Joe I watched years. the Bills. No matter how bad the Bills are, no matter how boring they are, when Dick Jerome was the coach, it doesn't matter what it was in the offense. There was no imagination to the offense, whatever you want to say, no matter how ugly the games were, the the 9-6 Cleveland Browns, Buffalo Bills game, maybe consider that the worst game ever, the most boring game ever. I watch those games. Yeah. I ain't like that with the Sabres. And we've talked about this. Mm-hmm. Dude, about a year or so ago on this podcast, I was telling you how much I hate this team. Yep. I wouldn't watch their games. I would follow it along on Twitter because I'd have to talk to you about these games and shit. But <laughs> I didn't watch them. To, but you had to. <laughs> I have made an appointment. I mentioned my. That's only one of two cool things that are going on with my kid and me right now. The other thing is, for the first time in his life and my life, we're bonding watching hockey. He is a guy. He's a kid who's becoming. He plays a. Uh, NHL 23 or whatever the hell the stupid yep. video game is for Xbox. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to sound like an idiot here, but whatever. <laughs> so he plays the game and he understands it and he's starting to watch and he loves watching these games. We have watched Sabres After Dark. They've played three games. I've watched every second of every one of those games. I've watched every second of their season so far. I watched every game wow. in its entirety. It has been fun. A huge change for you. It is a huge change for me because again, I'm 
maybe I am calling myself out and saying that I'm a bandwagon fan. Maybe I am because I'm telling you that I'm not watching them play when they're getting shut out, you know, and showing no heart all the time like they have in over the last several years, except for the end of last year, of course. Mm -hmm. But I, so I, my point is this, I'm really enjoying them right now, but yeah, I am being a little bit premature when I say yeah. I'm wrong to start thinking about, you know, mm -hmm. this team's going to be in the mix come late March for a playoff spot. I'm being a little bit too uh, optimistic at yeah. this point. Get through February. <laughs> if they're if they're if they're, if they're within single digits into into going into March, if it's let if it's fewer than eight points, I even have to cut it down that far. If it's fewer than eight points, that's you can do something with that. Uh, if it's ten, it's really hard just because of the three point games, and that's why I wish there was a three two one point thing for the league. Really wish it was that way because yeah. it would make things way more fun, way more interesting. Because a win. Winter regulation gets you three points instead of two. Okay. Like you're going to see, you would see teams really pressure sure. to try to either break a sure. tie or, you know, sure. whatever, because three points is way better than two. Because if you get two for winning overtime or a shootout, like, okay, like whatever, but you got two points, but man, three is way better. Sure. So, like, if you could, if you can cut into a, a deficit like that, it's way different. But like 10 points when you got like what, like 11, 12, 13 games to go is almost impossible. It was fun on Saturday watching them start well against Vancouver, kind of give it back a little bit. And then they kind of like took the, which you don't see this with Sabres hockey. They kind of took Vancouver's will away in the third period. You know, they scored. And it was like Vancouver on that last goal. They kind of almost gave up. I was like, wow, the Sabres are making teams tap. I don't even remember the last time I, <laughs> I've seen that shit. But I'll tell you this. So since I've been having you on the podcast, which has been for a long time now, probably the Sabres talk with me that resonates the most when it comes to having you on over the last couple of seasons is how you have talked before this even became, now everyone's talked about this, but mm -hmm. even at the time you were kind of like on the ground level saying, yo, something's up with Rasmus Dahlin, the way he was starting his seasons. You were talking about the mental aspect of this and that. And then he would seem to get his shit together as the season wore on, but it's like, he's throwing away half a season. Well, yeah. obviously that's not the case this year. No. Um, <laughs> He's got a goal in all five games. He, yep. he has eight points already. And again, we're taping this before the uh, Seattle game Tuesday. But man, this is, uh, you want to talk. By the way, the NHL's first star of the week, too. I should throw that out yes. there. So that's the equivalent of saying he's the, the player of the week. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. in, in the league. Mm -hmm. I, I, I could say this more eloquently, but that's not how I am. What a fucking start for Rasmus Dalin, <laughs> man. I mean, Jesus Christ, this guy is just ridiculous right now, mm -hmm. man. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, it's uh this is it's one of those moments where people like me and there's other people like me that have been like get this guy a real situation with a real coach with a real like a real, you know, a real setup. You're going to see the real guy at some point. Like his first two years with Housley were different because Housley just he was just basically coached him like the way the Sabres coached him when he was a young kid who scored a ton of points. It was just kind of like, yeah, just just go score points, man. It's great. We'll we'll figure out the defense later. And then Ralph came in and tried to figure out the defense to his detriment, to his very deep detriment. He did sure. that, and you get Granado in there and and Don just playing into people's strengths. You know, hey, what do you do well? Okay, let's make that work. Doing that with Darlin is like unleashing the beast because this dude's good. He's he's always been good. It's just people are too dumb to figure it out, like to do the right thing with them. And I'm, you know, feel bad for calling again, itchy nose talking about this, but I feel bad like calling, uh, you know, experienced NHL people dumb, but like, holy shit, dude, like, it, look what he's doing. Like, this is, this is stuff that he could have been at least on the road to start doing, you know, three years ago, maybe because he rookie year, like whatever, it's, it's fine. But Jeez, man, I, I, I just, it, it's, it's very gratifying to be able to say like, I told you so when it comes to this, because it was very obvious when he was a kid. I mean, he played in the freaking world juniors here and looked unbelievable. And people are like, wow, that'd be a great guy to get. Sabres kind of stink this year. It'd be cool if they got him. Well, sure did. They got him. And then it was like, well, we don't know what to do with him. How do you not know what to do with him? Like you, you do everything you can to make him good. And now they are. And now he's developed the attitude to to go with it, where it's, you know, he's he told us straight out. He's he's like, I've started not giving a shit what people say. 
Yeah. Sure plays like it. Like he's kind of like, I'm gonna do my thing and I don't give a crap what you you know if you if you hate it. Like good thing about that is because nobody hates it. <laughs> the only the only people that hate it are the guys he's playing against that he's given you know, he's given all kinds of grief to. <laughs> like those are the people that hate it. But like that makes him even better. Like it gets him even more involved in the games because he's being such a pest. Rasmus is to me is kind of like a an example of, you know, there's lots of players in sports, not even just hockey, just sports. They're like really talented guys. Not as talented. I mean, Darlene's like generational talent type yes. player. But mm -hmm. there's lots of guys around the league who are talented, but they probably, you never really end up seeing it sometimes. And then, and then these athletes, you know, these players underachieve and ultimately they're out of the league. And a lot of it is probably because of the system that they're in, you know, they never find the right system or they have the wrong coach. Cause if I'll tell you right now, if the Sabres would have saved a Kruger, I don't think we'd be seeing this Rasmus Dallin. I am sure. No, obviously you agree with no, that. And some of the wouldn't. teammates that are around him. Um, I know he's hurt right now, but I really like the way him and Samuelson were looking, which by the way, I went back and watched last week's show. And this was before the Sabres uh, hit the road for the four games. And I asked you a couple of things to look for. And you mentioned Samuelson specifically. And you said, watch him play against these top lines with Calgary and Edmonton. And I did. And man, that's a pretty tough injury right now. Now it's only, I mm -hmm. guess I read reports. It could maybe a couple of weeks. It could have been worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? This guy really is good. Yeah. He, he played, I mean, I'm kind of switching subjects here from Darlene mm -hmm. and going to Samuelson, but I, I kind of walked in after you said that. And he really does a lot of things out there that maybe don't always show up on the stat sheet and aren't the mm -hmm. sexy things, but. Man, he's playing good. But anyway, between Darlene and how he's looked, this blue line has suffered, uh, you know, I would assume that's something to be concerned about. Yoki Haru and yeah. now uh, Samuelson pilots up. So um, I guess they're getting tested early on with uh, their defensive line death with these injuries. Yeah. That's yeah, one shitty part so far. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate because, you know, it's a crew that you wanted to kind of see how they evolve as as things go because, you know, Labushkin looks like he's he's – pretty good he look, he look, he's like a good bouncer out there uh he's physical was he that good before he came here joe because he i know sabers i don't follow the league like you do yeah so like i didn't know shit about him before he got here or other than what i read or heard but mm -hmm. i feel like yeah. he's a good fit here yeah no he's a he's the exact kind of defenseman they needed to have they needed somebody who is like samuelson but like you know obviously you're not going to find somebody that's that's to that degree at least in their eyes uh, to, that plays that the very defensive style of hockey. That's Labushkin. Like he loves doing that. He loves to play physical. He he just enjoys the game. I mean, the, the guy just he has so much fun playing hockey. You know, I, I got I, you know I talked to him for the piece I did on Matthew Kachuk, and uh, none of the quotes made it into the piece. But he was just like he's like he's like that kind of stuff. He's like he's like man, the fans love it. He's like it's hockey. It's a game. Like you know how do you you know how do how do you not enjoy that? And I was like. He's like, I don't know. I'd be kind of annoyed if a guy was <laughs> pissing me off all game. He's like, yeah, sure, just hit him. Like, it's fine. I'm like, okay, that's good theory. But I mean, like, he was, uh, he played in Toronto and like his, I mean, his fancy stats were pretty decent in Toronto, all things considered. I mean, any Toronto fancy stats are going to look nice because they take tons of shots. But, uh, but he played pretty well there. He played pretty well in Arizona. Like, I mean, you know, considering how bad Arizona, <laughs> Arizona was, I mean, he looked, he still looked pretty good there, but. He's he's the exact need they they needed to have there because you know Yoki Haru's a good like balanced player like he's not physical but he just plays he just likes to play good defense fine you know Bryson's not that kind of guy he's smaller he's very heady about the game he carries the puck great uh, power I mean geez, we, we we're not we know power is going to be amazing but we just don't know which direction it's going to be I think it's going to be kind of it's going to be more it's going to be closer to what Darlene is I think but he's going to be he's going to be awesome um that's what I mean like this suddenly with Darlene looking the way he does you're like oh boy they have a wealth of riches now because now they have two guys that are going to play over 20 minutes a game and like you're covering two periods worth of the game with sure. two guys that are unbelievably on unbelievable yeah. back line so Labushkin's great because he's a he's a good compliment to the to everybody else who's who's a little bit more on the uh the puck moving side of things. He's it's super. Um all right, so obviously Rasmus hot start. Alex Tuck, six goals already. Yeah. Good on Don Granado, by the way, to say after even just one game, it's like yo, he needs to play with Skinner and Thompson. We need that top line back. It's made mm -hmm. a big difference. 
Here's the funny thing, though, and I, and I say this a lot on the podcast. I feel like I don't talk about goaltending enough. And <laughs> the reason why, for all the excitement and the and the rushes, the odd man rushes and some of the sweet plays that we're seeing, it's been the goaltending right now that mm -hmm. has been the rock of this hockey team so yeah. far. Um, Comrie's got well, – I'm looking at the sets right now. And, again, going into the Seattle game, point nine three zero save percentage. And he was spectacular both in Edmonton and yeah. Calgary. I mean, mm -hmm. it was fun to watch him play. He was amazing. Yeah. Um, Craig Anderson's only allowed two goals in two games, 0. 0.970 save percentage. Um, yeah, you know, again, the fanciness <laughs> of Darlene and talking all these sweet goals and Tage Thompson, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, right now, the biggest strength of the Sabres early, very, very early on mm -hmm. might be the goaltending. And it looks like it's something that's made to work because Conrad looked good in small sample sizes before coming here. Mm -hmm. And Anderson, of course, it's he's 41 years old. He ain't playing 50, 60 games. No, nope. but it feels like they got the right recipe right now. Of course, they got to stay healthy, but they got the right recipe right. for this to be. Do you feel like it's maybe not these numbers specifically, but yeah. this looks like somewhat sustainable goaltending, doesn't it? This it's a, it's a, it's a pairing. It's a tandem that I thought was, was really interesting to begin with, because I think Comrie Comrie's the way more, was the more the unknown factor just because it's, you know, he didn't have like what, 28 NHL games or something like that. Right. 19 of them were last season. So I, you know, you kind of think you know what you're getting with them, but you don't know. And, you know, it's not enough of a sample size to really you know, figure out what the fancy stats are. Thankfully, the fancy stat crew of the Sabres is a lot smarter than me and a lot of the other people online. So they 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 know more of what they're looking at. But I, I said when they signed him, I said it's a, wor it's a risk worth taking because it is a risk because you don't know what he's going to be. Sure. It's a risk worth taking, though, because some of those underlying numbers were good. Uh, you know, you, you, you figure out what the guy's work ethic is. You talk to people around the league, you, you figure it out, figured out that part of it really fast. And he's a guy that just, he just exudes positivity always. Like he's just an, an unbelievably positive guy where it's startling. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's one of those like, uh, PTSD moments for, for, for me as a reporter, going to the room and talking to a guy and having him be like, Hey, thanks for talking with me. I'm like, Oh, okay. He's, <laughs> have a great day. Like, th thanks, Eric. Yeah, I will now. This is this is cool. As opposed to you know somebody giving you crappy quotes and couldn't wait to get away from you fast. I know everybody's thinking who that those people probably are, but like I'll tell you, it's way more than those guys <laughs> that were like that. But um, but I mean, you can you 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 can figure out that you know if it doesn't work, okay. Then then Kevin Adams has to take a lot of heat because it would be two years in a row, he didn't really address goaltending very well. And, you know, it, I mean, the goaltending last year was bad enough that, you know, they had to, they had to send what Aaron Dell down to Rochester and bring somebody else up because nobody was getting anything done. Right. You know, mm -hmm. like, while Anderson was hurt, they were just like, Jesus, this guy's supposed to be our backup. He can't do anything right. <laughs> Fine. Bring up somebody else from Rochester. We'll, we'll get this figured out, but, uh, or we'll trade for Malcolm Subban. We'll put that guy in net instead. Like, you know, fine. But, um, but yeah, it's it's nice to see at least a, a major offseason question because goaltending was absolutely one of the biggest ones. I mean, we sure. danced around it because how many times can you talk about it? But um, but you'd like to see that they're that they're playing very well. Uh, they're playing very much under control. And even the Panthers game that, that Comrie lost, not really his fault. Like the guy stood on his head that game. Like he was he was very good in that game. He, you know, give up four goals, okay, whatever. But like hold the pan, you know, try to do better holding them down, you know, like that's, you know, play a little bit smarter, do things like that. But if you can boil it down and make uh, disseminating all that stuff a lot, a lot easier, boy, that, that helps. It helps. Probably my favorite off likes moment for the Sabres so far this season, like all the locker room sound bikes and stuff. I think it was after the Edmonton game where Rasmus Dahlin said, where have you been all my life? When he said to a reporter when he was asked about Comrie, goes, where has he been all my life? He said something <laughs> like that. I thought that was funny. But, yeah, it's um, you could tell that the players really like him. You could tell he's got oh, yeah. a great attitude. Of course, he's performing well. And also a little bit of gravy here is that UPL's healthy and he's getting these minutes in Rochester. Mm -hmm. So if and you hope it doesn't happen right now, but if something were to happen to one of these guys, uh, you know, UPL is getting more and more experience every day playing right now, all these minutes in Ro in Rochester. The goaltending feels much more promising right now, I should say, at yeah. least, than it did last year because such the goaltending was so freaking bad last year, especially yeah. when Anderson wasn't playing. Yeah, it's 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 soothing to see, to see the goaltending be a bit better and a bit stronger.
Hot take alarm. Yeah, I know. It's a little, Mini one. Horrible hot take. Wow, the goal. It's nice to have good goaltending. Hot take. Look <laughs> out. Um, but no, I, 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 I've had. I've had ideas in my head of like how it will work depending on which, if, if a goalie gets hurt, I have to say if, and I can't say when, cause you just don't know, but like sure. depending on what, if what, depending on which guy gets hurt, if they get hurt, how they handle it, who comes up from Rochester, because that'll be really curious to see. Cause I think it, I think depending on who it is, it's a different, it's a different guy depending on which, which current saber was that, that ends up having to sit out for, for any amount of time. I think it's, a, I think it's a different goalie each depending on which guy it is. But that's just that's just my own gut. But but we don't have to worry about that now because they're they're all healthy. Everybody's healthy. Even Subban's Subban's a few weeks away, and he just skated today. So like, it's great. You missing the rink, Ben? So they play Seattle tonight, yeah. and this is the final leg again of this four game Western uh, Sabers after dark swing. Now they got a four game homestand coming up: uh, Montreal, Chicago, Detroit, and Pittsburgh. Obviously, I, I was being rhetorical and, and sarcastic. <laughs> I, I know you missed the rink, and mm-hmm. you'll look forward to being back with practices and covering the games. Also. Before we uh, end with a couple of minutes of Bill's talk anyway, so you and Lance do maintenance day. Mm-hmm. Isn't it just so much more fun to, to to get together and hit that record button and talk Sabres when there's exciting things to talk about, yes. there's topics that are worthy. <laughs> Instead of having to try to create something positive when there's not really much there, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's just, mm-hmm. it feels like, for, for, whether again, whether it's you and Lance doing the podcast every week or just any Sabres content creator yeah. out there right now, it's just, and again, it's early. It is early. I know that. I'm trying to caution myself here, but right. it just, it's got to be a lot more fun to just shoot the shit and, and, and talk hockey when, when you're covering a team that's playing like they are right now. Yeah, it's uh, it's something where I think all of us are. If we have any superstitions, we're we're hanging on to them pretty hard right now because we're like, okay, if this trend keeps going, this is very good for all of us. And it's it, you know, and not just from like a you know uh, like a business standpoint, but like just the the everyday happiness standpoint because because sure. you know, when things go south with a with a with a bad team, every time you walk into the room gets a little bit you get a little bit tighter about it because because we all know losing sucks we all know it's it's horrible nobody likes to do it nobody likes to deal with it players certainly don't like getting asked about it all the time that's that's for damn sure but like we got a job to do they got a job to do and part of their job is having to deal with us and like the last thing we want to do is harp on bad stuff and negative stuff all the time but and you know, just makes everybody's job a little easier when the team wins because we can just focus on things that are like, wow, hey, what worked great on that play? Instead of being like, so you gave up five three on ones tonight. Can you explain? Can you explain what happened? I mean, like, it's 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 such a difference because it just picks everybody up in, in general. I mean, it, geez, it's. I think back to some of those tank years, man, and like you were just. You're just coming into the room and you're like, what are we going to do today? Like, because most of the questions in those seasons were were for people that weren't in the room. They were for the people above them. And, you know, how many questions you know, are they going to answer? You mentioned something. And my stance has been, at least the way it is today, that, you know, most media people say they don't care who wins the games. And I respectfully, in most cases, disagree with that. And, and you say, you say that part of the player's job is to deal with you guys. Part of your job is to deal with these guys. And I don't care what you or anyone says when a team is losing every game, though the the demeanor, the attitude, it sucks. You know, they don't want to deal with you because who wants to talk about how bad you are? Right. You know what I'm saying? How bad I'm playing, how bad my teammates are playing, how bad we're being coached, how, Mm -hmm. you know, how we're finding ways to lose every fucking game. Uh, There go my mouth again. I'm getting up. (laughs) I'm passionate about this episode, man. But but you know what I'm saying? It's like, I think it's more fun to do your job when you're covering a team that's maybe not necessarily one of the best teams, but they're interesting. And yeah. I just think it it gives a better perspective. So I don't, I don't buy people out there who say that they could not care less how the team does that they're covering. And maybe I'm wrong, but I, that's just my attitude. From from our standpoint, and you know, again, I I didn't grow up a Sabres fan, so I don't have those I don't have those, I get that. those I get feelings. That. But um, I did watch a ton of the Sabres growing up. But you know, I was I wasn't a fan of the team. I always hoped they did well. That was always my my thing with them. I hope they did well because you know, hey, they're New York. It's cool. Like you know, they're not in the city, so that's cool too. Like that's great. Um, 
but it's just it's better for business for everybody yeah it's it just makes everybody it's less stressful less anxious going in the rooms when things are like at this level like if it stays at a level where you know there's you know a couple more wins than losses instead of you know stringing you know multiple multiple game sure loss, you know losing streaks together in a season it just makes it better for everybody because you can you can tell you can tell i don't want to say tell better stories because even even with bad teams and i forget i remember mike harrington telling me this and i forget who said it originally but you'd never want to cover a mediocre team you either want to cover a great team or you want to cover the worst team because sure. those are interesting anywhere in that that middle section like if you're not a playoff team and you're like you know and maybe and you say you're not a playoff team and you didn't miss the playoffs by like one point you missed it by like 10 yeah. and you're just kind of like oh they're just johnny average team like great the bills for 15 years 15 of the 17 yeah. drought years that, they're, yeah, they're boring. I mean, six and ten every year maybe seven right. and nine if you got lucky and that but not yeah. really never really snipped the playoffs yeah I, I that that's not wrong and look i'm a, i'm a buffalo guy and i'm a buffalo fan so i would be lying if i said i had no emotional investment but if i was you know if i was covering a team professionally like you do and but let's say it was in buffalo say i got a chance to go cover the new jersey devils day one when i cover that beat I'm hoping they're good. I'm just mm -hmm. telling you, that. I ain't going to root for them. Right. I'm not going to openly root for them anyway. I should say, you know, right. a little fist pump in my own little heart <laughs> when, when they're playing well, because again, I think it makes my job easier. And I think more people are engaged and interested mm -hmm. when they're playing well. But anyway, my whole point was it's got to be much fun, for, more, much more fun for you and Lance to get together oh, yeah. and hit record and talk shop when, when, when you got fun things to talk about and the team's playing well. Yeah. That's yeah. We, we get to, uh, I think for parts of, uh, cause we started, we started the pod last December and for parts of like that, from when we started until, you know, the season ended, there were some chunks there where maybe our snarkiness was like a little bit too sharp. And we were just kind of like, Ooh, we sound kind of mean sometimes, but, but it's, but it's something where like the fans are kind of like, yeah, no, I agree. You know, where, you know, I mean, listen, there was a ton of people in your shoes, Pat, where they just stopped giving a shit. They stopped watching. And they were just like, whatever, call me, call me when you get back to the postseason, yeah. then, we'll, then we'll talk. But, um, but putting an entertaining product on the ice and having some, some young stars that are enjoy it and having like a whole, a whole unit together with, you know, with, you know, the, the players, the coaches, the management, um, PR, everybody, everybody's on the same page where it's like, Hey, let's have fun with this as opposed to you know, making it drudgery every day and like having knives out for one side or the other and just being you know, kind of shitty about things, you know, like it, instead it's just kind of like, Hey, let's, let's, we're having fun here. Let's all, let's make this work. Yeah. Well, you know, like I, I do this podcast with you every week and I always have fun talking with you. I have fun shooting the shit with you, whether it's small talk, talking bills, whatever we may do. But until recently, I hated talking about the Sabres. I mean, if I were, if I wasn't lazy, I'd go back and dig up clips for evidence. Uh, and it would just be a weekly, oh, now we got to talk Sabres. And I would go on a rant about how much I hate the team and I hate the Bagulas and I hate the front office and this and that. It's just a different vibe. It's a, and it's a different environment when you're, uh, when you're a fun team to watch. So anyway, yeah. and uh, speaking of fun, I mean, all right, so Buffalo Bills, Sunday night. By the way, so before we, 2022 is, might be the year of Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes for sure. We'll see. But this is definitely so far anyway, the year of uh it's looking like the year that a lot of these old quarterbacks around the league just completely fall off a cliff, man. Mm -hmm. Tom Brady does not look good. Matt Ryan is awful and he's benched. His Indianapolis Colts career is probably for all intents and purposes over. Russ Wilson. <laughs> Who knows? Denver's <laughs> that, a mess. He, he, they're on their way to making one of the worst trades in the history of the NFL with Russ Wilson. But anyway, Russ Wilson washed. Matt Ryan washed. Tom Brady may not wash, but he ain't what he was. He's, also, he's, he's headed 45. towards that cliff. His team <laughs> around him, they're old. They look unmotivated. And then you have uh, the Bills opponent at quarterback Sunday, Aaron Rodgers, man. Mm -hmm. They are, they've lost, what, three straight games. Packers have not lost four straight games, by the way, since 2016. But the Packers come into this game 10 and a half point underdogs. It is the single biggest margin of Aaron Rodgers' entire career. And everything I'm saying right now, by the way, is music to Joe Yurden's ears. Mm -hmm. I can promise you that he That's is right. 
I'm in, I'm live I'm reveling in this a little bit right now because again, this is the one week where Joe Yurden is a Buffalo Bills fan and not a watcher. So That's we're right. on the same page here. But anyway, before we talk about the, like the Bills Packers game, real quick, just, yeah. I mean, you knew sooner or later these quarterbacks they got to fall off, right? Which, except for Geno Smith, by the way. I mean, he's 31, 32. He's still yeah, a little, a little different with him, right? Like, right. But these guys, I mean, Russ Wilson, they're all they're cooked. Aaron Rodgers is getting close to that too. I, I, yeah. I feel like he sure ain't it shit ain't the two time MVP that I've seen so far this year. Yeah. Devontae Adams made that much of a difference. Mm. I mean, it helps certainly sure. helps to have a, have a go to guy like that. Absolutely, but I mean. If you're Devonte Adams and you built your built your whole stock up, you know, taking taking passes from him, don't you think you'd want to like keep doing that? Instead, he was kind of like the sec- second a contract his contract was up and it was like time to go somewhere else. He's like, yeah, peace. I'll go to the Raiders, the, the known stable franchise, the Las Vegas Raiders. It was like you know? Aaron Aaron Rodgers like wanting him gone, man. He said, well, I don't know why he would Such well sign off on a trade. I mean, Aaron Rodgers could have said, listen, you're not trading my top receiver. I'm not going to play football for you, man. Yeah, didn't happen. I don't know. I, I watch. Listen, I have a friend in Florida. One of my best friends lives in Florida. He grew up with me here in Buffalo, and he lives with uh, a, a girl in Florida who's a huge Packers fan. I hate the Packers. No, I'm just gonna tell you that right now. Good. And she makes me hate the Packers even more. Good. But anyway, <laughs> I uh, I forgot where I was going with this. I had a oh, so for that reason, I get extra joy out of watching the Packers lose, even more than normal in in the past. I've watched them. I watched that Washington game. I watched them lose to the Jets at home. Mm. I'm like, God damn, this team sucks. And <laughs> <laughs> they do, man. They punked I, out by the Giants, too. Like, yeah, hmm. it's like, I don't know. As a Bills fan, because you are a Bills fan this week, mm-hmm. do you have to worry a little bit about almost being overconfident? Because this is still a two time MVP quarterback they're playing back to back. In fact, raining. It's not like two former, like way in the past. We're mm-hmm. talking about last year and the year before that. The MVP of the NFL is coming into town. And I almost feel like when you're, you know, when you got, when you're that good, you're due. It's like, do you got And they're tending it. Nobody thinks they're going to win, including Aaron Rodgers said that. Ain't nobody thinking we're going to win. Yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like I'm almost. I'm I'm being careful to straddle the line and not be overconfident if I'm the Buffalo Bills right now. Because no. all signs point to them whipping Green Bay's ass. They're gonna. <laughs> they're gonna. There's expert Joe Yurden analysis. Oh, they're, they're, they're gonna. They're gonna whoop their. Uh, this is like to me. This is just like the Pittsburgh game, where everybody's like, I don't know, Pittsburgh. They got some stuff. We lost to them last year. I don't know. The game was over after the end of the first quarter, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like th- this is going to be the same thing. The Packers can't hang like the, the Jets. I mean, the Jets defense is pretty good, but they walked into Lambeau and slapped them around the Jets, the yeah, New York them, football man. Jets. Yeah, they like, pushed them. They pushed them around that football field, man. There's no question about it. And so did Washington to some extent yeah, that shocked me a little bit. I mean, Washington's no good either. Like we we're very well aware of that, but Man, oh man, it, they, it, I, there's nothing about Green Bay, and I can't believe they've even won three games. Like that's the that's the part that kills me. Like how the hell did this team win three games? They 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 look they look like a mess. Rodgers is a drama queen. Like it's just all this stuff is just all over the place. And you're like, man, come on, just get out of the way already. Like I'm pretty confident, and it's hard to have any confidence in the Minnesota Vikings, but I'm pretty confident they're going to win the 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 NFC North. The question is whether or not Green Bay is going to be a wild card level team or not. And I'm like, I don't know, man. If they're a wild card level team, take some wild cards away because they're no. They're they're at, they're at, they're like the Buccaneers. The, even worse with the Buccaneers. The Buccaneers are probably still going to win the NFC South because that division is just complete trash. I mean, Carolina and Atlanta ain't going to win it. No. The Saints are probably the one team that roster wise could stack up with Tampa, but they're two and five. You know, so yeah. to your point, the the Green Bay Packers are very lucky. That they're in the uh, NFC. By the way, you, you want to hear your uh, your cool Josh Allen stat for the week? I, this I didn't find Sports Radar. I got to give credit to Josh Allen could beat Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, and Aaron Rodgers all in October. He could become the first quarterback since Troy Aikman in 1996 to beat three NFL MVP quarterbacks in a four game span. Aikman beat Marino, Steve Young, and Brett Favre. Pretty cool stat, man. Beat it up yeah. on. Former MVP quarterbacks coming off a bye. The Bills have never lost under McDermott off a bye, but oh God, I don't know, man. I know what you're saying. 
and I agree with you. I want to agree with you, but I still get a little bit trepidatious. By the way, I think we'll find out more on Wednesday. People are hearing us on Wednesday. I think this might be the week Trey White plays you on top of that. So they're going to get a big yeah. boost. Beating I, Green I would, Bay up. I bet anything Trey White play, plays yeah. this week. Beating up Green Bay on national television would be a lot of fun, man. I'm, I'm not going to lie, man. Yes. I hate Aaron Rodgers with a passion. I like your Detroit team, man. I think you guys are you in a good the worst position. team in the NFL, Pat. Yeah, but that you guys, team? yes, I'm telling you this, man. Detroit has building blocks. They, ha- I love Hutchinson, by the way. He's great. Um, and He's they, super. you, you guys have, you're competitive, and I don't know. Let me end this by asking you this, because we'll kind of circle back to the Sabers, because you're not a Sabers fan. Mm-hmm. But when the Sabres were tanking, you, you know, you're covering, you're writing about hockey. You ain't got no emotional investment in that. Right. So you don't give a shit. But you're a Detroit Lions fan. Mm-hmm. Do you want the Detroit Lions to be competitive but lose? Are you pro tank when it comes to a team that you actually do have an emotional investment in? This might explain how Sabres fans might have felt during the Jack Eichel tank. Like right now, be and be honest with the listeners here, man. Do you want the Lions to go out and lose the rest of their games or finish dead last? I don't have to hope for it, Pat. It will just nah. <laughs> you're this a team went 0 and 16, like before it <laughs> became cool to do that. Okay. Like I'm I'm I if I had to bet anything, we get into the last like four or five weeks of the season, they'll they'll win a couple of like games where you're like, wow, they look really good. And then people will be like, where was this team all year? And you're like, yeah, well, they started caring when people started making fun of them. Like that, that's, that's when they start to care is when you know, people start picking on them. Like that, the, when they finally beat, when they finally got a win last year over, and they played the Vikings and the Vikings made like one of the unbelievably dumb mistakes late in the game to, to ensure that it happened. It was just kind of like, well, they probably should have lost that game too, but Minnesota's a stupid team and they allowed Detroit to win. That I don't have to hope for Detroit to lose every game. I don't. You're because, predicting how it's going to happen. I'm asking you if what you would do. You want to see that happen? Do you want to see them no. finish with the worst record league? You'd rather see them no. win some games. No, I want them. I want them to be a respected franchise, and unfortunately, they haven't been one in 35 years. Okay, so At now least. you're you're explaining the opposite end of the anti Bills tanker or Sabers tanker. Back in the days, a lot of people agree with what you're saying right now. It's more important to to, to get W's, to get respect around the league and in your own locker room. So yeah, you're but, like, no, I don't want Detroit to keep losing it every yeah, yeah. one in sixteen. Right, but the drought bills, the drought bills, like I meant Sabers, were, by the way. Oh, Sabers, oh, well, Sabers uh, tank. That's what I meant. Okay. Like okay. people were anti Sabers tank. You're like, no, man, you got you play to win the games. You know, it's important to get respect in your own locker room and around your and build a culture of, of trying to win. That's what I'm saying. No, it's uh no, the Lions exist in a nihilist lifestyle, like where nothing matters, <laughs> nothing is good, only the bad will happen, and like that is their existence. Like it, they're 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 the eat Arby's team of the NFL. Like you don't like you you uh, honestly, I I don't even have to think about whether I want them to tank or not because they're probably gonna do it on their own merits without even trying. They're the kind of team that if they tried to bottom out, if they tried. They would win five games, five, six games, <laughs> and screw it up completely for themselves. I'm I'm so – and, like, this is where I have a lot of sympathy with Sabres fans. I am so over picking at the top of the goddamn draft. I am so sick of being able to watch the first hour of the NFL draft and be like, well, my team's done. We'll see you later. Right. Like, I'm so over it. Figure your shit out. Get I agree. It, figure it out. Quit being the joke of the NFL. Like that's- Actually, I, I just said I, I – Everything you said is right, but I'd be lying to you. If I was a Detroit Lions fan right now, I would be like, listen, I want to look good, but I think it's imperative that we get one of the top two quarterbacks coming out of this draft, which is going to require you to finish probably in the bottom three, which they probably will anyway, like you said, whether they're trying to or not. Thankfully, Houston got a tie this year, so they (laughs) they got the half game up on Detroit. (laughs) But like the Sabres right now, they got their building blocks. Like even if the Sabres have no chance to make the playoffs, I think it's going to be January and they're semi-buried. I ain't going to start rooting for them to lose so they can get a better draft pick. I think wins are important. Yes. I don't know. This, I just always this group, I, it's absolutely important. Do not I do I not always go ahead. Take out. You can't take out with the, with the, with this crew you can't do that. No, you play every game for them is is this whole like last season was a building block, this season's a building block. You do not lose on purpose. Even though even though there are three potential 
franchise players at the top of this year's NHL draft. You know, you play ahead. Now, things got really dire and you had lots of guys get injured. Maybe then you're thinking like, well, if we get range of the lottery, Connor Bedard would be pretty cool. But if we pick top three, that's cool too. But no, this team is not in that position right now. They they need they need to win. They need to get everybody's confidence up because listen, they're going to bring in Matt Savoy next year. He's going to be freaking great. Like they got, they got nothing to worry about. Like yeah. just do it right. That's what they have to do. Detroit have, is not the, the Detroit Lions are not in a spot to do anything right because they never do it right. Now that was good timing with the hot take alarm there in the background. That's not a hot. That's that's basic knowledge, man. <laughs> I, I, to me, t- tanking versus non-tanking has always been one of the most fascinating subjects. I think there are certain players in certain times where you do tank, like basketball. Victor Rabinella, the, 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 the seven foot four oh. dude coming out. If if you're the Orlando Magic and you got zero chance of doing anything this year, fuck that. I'm losing every game. If it's going to increase my chances, they just had the number one pick, didn't they? Um, yeah. Last year, like well, the, the, right. that kid, like two. that kid looks pretty good. He twenty points in his <laughs> twenty points in each of his first four games. Come on! All right, man. I don't know how this turned into a tanking thing. We're calling the Detroit Lions at the end of the podcast, but that's where we're at. <laughs> no, the Detroit Lions are the tank. That's that's where they like everybody else wants the tank. The Lions are the tank. Everyone, give Joe a follow on Twitter at Joe Yurden. Made his day podcast with Lance Lazowski every Monday. Noted hockey, Joe Substack. Make sure you check that shit out. Subscribe to it, especially after saving because I, I really am starting to get into uh, your observations following uh, the Appreciate games. That. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, the Sabres coming home for this homestand and hearing and reading a lot of your stuff coming from the Rickers, too. South so, Buffalo uh, Zone is going to be in town Saturday. Pat Kane. Who's that? Patrick Kane. Oh, duh. Remember him? <laughs> Talk to you later, guys.